That's why HIPAA, the acronym, it stands for Health Insurance Payments Automatically Apply. <laughs> <laughs> and we're off. Okay, let's get it. <laughs> let's move along. So, to... Somebody's going to use that somewhere. I swear David said it. <laughs> You're listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast where HIPAA and humor collide to make learning fun. Your delightful hosts are Donna Grindle and David Sims. Relax, HIPAA help is on the way. Welcome to episode 377 of the Help Me With HIPAA podcast. My name is David Sims of HIPAA for MSPs. Joining me is Donna Grindle of the Big Green K card. <laughs> Actually, Blue K. <laughs> it can be the Blue K and the Green yeah. K. It's a K. <laughs> K. Blue and green. It's a colorful K. <laughs> <sighs> so, as we sit here today, I'm very depressed and sad that my one of my favorite places on earth that I go every year to wind down, disconnect, and relax is probably, well, it's a life-changing. Things will never be the same on Sanibel Island. Yep. Hurricane is... Sitting on top of it as we speak. Yes. So, and you were supposed to be where yeah. today? I, I was. I was leaving. I'm supposed to leave tomorrow morning to go to Sanibel <laughs> Island. So, yes. This is Mother's Nature's way of saying, Donna, stay home. Donna, get your <laughs> we work done. We don't need you down yeah. here. As a matter of fact, well, the thing, all yeah. the places that you like are getting hit. So, I, I, I made a comment yeah. to you before we started recording that I'm glad you don't like where I live. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Key West got hit. You know, I love Sanibel. The thing is, I was supposed to go to Sanibel for a week and then go for a week and a half to St. Pete, which has also been in the crosshairs of this thing. So Key West, Sanibel, St. Pete, all impacted. But Sanibel, I mean, where we go and have been going for 30 years, it probably would be gone because it sits right on, you know, the island and, and it's gorgeous. So uh, at least I have a lot of pictures. But then it's also going to hit Savannah. I love Savannah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, uh, why Ian and I are, you know, we're not getting along at all. So anyway, I'm very sad about it. I don't know what condition I will be in. Next week when I cannot be on that beach because there's no way I know I'm going to even be able to get there. Yeah. Then it'll be Hurricane Donna. <laughs> yeah. That name got retired before I was born, thankfully. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Though. I've seen you going to some of these places. It's <laughs> It can be like that. Can it can be time. like that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she definitely changes the landscape. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if you're doing it, do it right. That's what I always say. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm just yeah. thankful that we've never spent a night in jail together. <laughs> I know. I, I have one of those signs, you know, that says, you know, a friend will come bail you out of jail. A good friend will be sitting there going, "Damn, that was fun." <laughs> I remember that one time you and I were out. And you were like, you're going to have to drive us home. And I was like, mm -hmm. I'm way past that point. We're going to have to get a pedicab. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't neither one of us driving yeah. home. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. We had a great time. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> uh, good times. You got to have those stories. And that that's what makes life worth living. If you can't tell some funny story about it, then. Yeah, that was the week you and I spent. What was it five days together or something like that? Uh huh. That that was the week that ended with the Nanner story. <laughs> we were. I think we were both shocked that we weren't sick of each other by the end of it. <laughs> yeah, I know. We were like, wow, yeah. it wasn't as bad as I thought it was gonna be. <laughs> yeah, you're not as evil as I thought. You're not as hard to live with I as know. I thought. And no matter how we look at it, you know, it's it's questionable uh, about our choices. <laughs> <laughs> We're together no matter what we do. <laughs> yep. All <sighs> right. So the Privacy and Security Boot Camp, never mentioned this before, but it is a three and a half day in-person event, March 12, 13, 14, and 15. You can find out more at prisecbootcamp.com. You should go ahead and pause this episode, go there now, buy your tickets. 
Yes, it is going to be a blast. Mm -hmm. So we are now to make sure we're doing, because we have been instructed for do better things. <laughs> <laughs> Again, we do not make good choices on our own, apparently. We're going to do, for the next few episodes, we're going to cover each day the kinds of topics that we're planning on talking about. So to you know start this off, we're talking about the scrim day. So that everything has a theme that is kind of tied around. And it is the Supply Chain Risk Management Day. The very first day is just the afternoon. We start on Sunday afternoon and we do discuss what is supply chain risk management, the why. Everything we do in this thing will be the why and the how. If you don't understand the why, then the how doesn't make as much sense and it's harder to focus. Yeah. <laughs> So we're going to talk about the why, and then we'll talk about how you, you know, all the things you have to do, and we'll actually do a couple of different sessions uh, that break out. You got to choose um, or send, you know, your privacy officer and your security officer, your compliance officer, or whatever. But the covering why all this matters and how it applies to business associates and covered entities, because... Neither side understands the other in those transactions, and they need to understand each other better. Mm -hmm. I, and I get on these calls sometimes when there's uh, somebody's asked my thoughts on, you know, this piece of a BAA, and I'll say, well, blah, blah. And then I end up on a call with both sets of them and the attorneys to say, well, here's what I'm worried about. Solve it. Talk amongst yourselves. I'll be right here. <laughs> But that's why we want to do that. We want to encourage that so that you understand the big picture. And then we get into the vendor selection and vetting requirements and what those mean and why those matter and a session on contract management and negotiations, again, going into that piece. So you've got more of the technical side and the evaluation and looking at the details and then the administrative side and uh, those pieces and parts as well. Uh, those will all be covered on Sunday afternoon. So that's a half day, but a lot of data going to be shooting past you to kind of warm you up for what the next three days are going to bring. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we've got the uh, you got to prove it day will be next. <laughs> and. <laughs> Uh, then uh, we'll cover that next week in more detail. And then, you know, the Risky Business Day. <laughs> da -na 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 -na. Yeah, I got my underwear ready. Oh, I can't <laughs> wait. You're going to come sliding on that I don't stage. I'm slide on it's carpet, but I'm going <laughs> face plant. I, I, we, could get, we could get a dance floor, no worries. <laughs> but we got that. And then uh, Murphy's Law Day because, well, Anything that can go wrong will go wrong, and we might as well play yeah, for it. Yeah, might as well call it David's Law Day. <laughs> <laughs> the Law of David. Yeah. Yes. So it's it's definitely one of the uh, best times you'll ever have <laughs> with HIPAA <him. laughs> or any privacy and security program. Bring it on over, priceacbootcamp.com. <laughs> Best time you ever had with HIPAA and your clothes on. <laughs> 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 well, we'll promise one of those. We know we'll promise the other. I uh, know, uh, right? <laughs> <laughs> we just talked about David in his underwear, <laughs> and we've already had to have one HIPAA boot camp where it was David without a shirt, and that's a whole other story we'll go into yeah. another time. Yeah, that was a... Uh... Shirtless David. Yeah, you know the thing about it, too, is I found out that Donna is very quick to disseminate information <laughs> to people when it comes to poking at me. <laughs> and vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That leads us into our HIPAA say what segment. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks to our donors, though. We always want to make sure we say that. Thank you for those of you who give us, uh, throw us some, some kibble. We need mm -hmm. it. We do. All right. So, so HIPAA say what? Yeah, I know. It's hard to do. <laughs> One day I'm going to get a button for that. So I, I read a question on the forum. Actually, it was today. 
And uh, it was from an MSP, his MSP forum. And the guy was asking a question about HIPAA compliant credit card processing. Kinda. <laughs> kinda. Kinda, yeah, kinda was kinda. his question. And if you know anything about answering HIPAA questions, you know that there's typically tons more conversation that has to be had, but I don't have time for tons more conversation and they're not paying for consulting. So I give them what I can give them based on the one or two sentences <laughs> they give. All right. But other MSPs jump right in, you know, because everybody's an expert. But one guy was like, oh, I don't think HIPAA applies to credit card information. And another guy was like, PCI is what you're talking about, not HIPAA. And then yet another guy said, well, HIPAA is only for PHI. And then one smart guy said, let's tag David. <laughs> let's put David out yeah. there. So, uh, which, you know, I have to, he, he actually might be listening to the guy that tags because I think he does listen uh, often and he tag every time he sees HIPAA, he tags me. So, I love that. Thank I know, you. I love that. Thank you. Appreciate you listening. Appreciate you tagging Dave. Yeah. Tag, you're it. <laughs> I will have to say, though, the caveat here is he wasn't really asking a question about HIPAA. Uh, he was asking a question about HIPAA. Oh. But I give him a pass on it. So. <laughs> but basically what I told him, and, and you can read my response in the show notes, but basically I told him that, you know, contrary um, to popular belief in the thread that payment information is actually PHI, but uh, mm -hmm. HIPAA does allow for the use and disclosure of that PHI for treatment, payment, and healthcare operations, or as we say, TPO. <laughs> there you go. Now we weren't talking about treatment and, and healthcare operations, only payments. So I basically said, based on, the little bit you told me, like literally two sentences, it's not covered, basically. You can do that. You can charge somebody's credit card, and it's not going to be something that HIPAA is going to get on you about. However, I went on to say there are some things about minimum necessary uh, that you need to know about. There's something in your notice of privacy practices where you need to talk about how you're disclosing the PHI for payments. So it's a lot more than just you ain't got to worry about it. Mm-hmm. You don't have to worry about it, but you need to worry about yeah, it. what you don't need to worry about so that you're not worrying about what you shouldn't worry about. <laughs> like, you know, that happens sometimes. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Uh, so uh, just remember, everything in HIPAA is a fact-specific determination. Or I sometimes much, like yeah. to say HIPAA has a lot of howevers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's always a question of the details. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, is so-and-so a business associate? Well, I'm going to need a lot more information. Yeah, so we didn't get into that. Yeah, there's so much more information that needs to be gathered that to be able to fully answer that. And you're right. I mean, it would require me to do some level of consulting or, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, to to get into the details, I mean, some of it's pretty straightforward, but it's like even banks. In some cases, banks fall under a HIPAA business associate scenario. In other cases, banks do not. Yeah. Well, just like we were talking last night and when I was talking to a behavioral therapist and she's telling me about she needs to do more with her HIPAA program and she needs to have better security and she's got to have all these HIPAA policies and procedures and HIPAA, HIPAA, HIPAA. And she was talking the right talk. Like telling me how she needs to, she wants to do better and, and have a great, robust HIPAA program. <laughs> and then like 20 minutes into the conversation, she says something to me and I'm like, what would you just say? <laughs> uh, you're not, you say what? And, and basically I said, based on what you just told me, um, HIPAA doesn't apply to you. So we just spent 20 minutes talking about something that doesn't <laughs> apply to you. <laughs> and she's like, what? <laughs> I was like, yeah. No, yeah. don't. It doesn't. And she's like, are you serious? Because I've got HIPAA insurance, which I don't know what that necessarily means, but <laughs> I've got, know. Uh, you know, my HIPAA attorneys and all that. I was like, well, I'm sorry to tell you that, you know, the IT guy has to be the one to tell you that you didn't have, yeah, you didn't have to do any of that. Everybody else, I guess, is just trying so, to take your money. I don't know. <laughs> 
Well, for, for the thing is, is that many people don't understand that that little caveat there that you have to be a provider of care who also transmits a covered transaction. Mm-hmm. If you do not transmit a covered transaction uh, electronically, you don't fall under HIPAA. And, you know, I expect that at some point that will change. But right now, if you're not doing insurance, if you are not filing insurance electronically, I mean, I suppose some people could still file insurance on paper, but I don't know where that could happen. It would be a really tiny little plan. But if it's on paper, HIPAA doesn't apply. If it's no insurance, you never file it at all, HIPAA doesn't apply. HIPAA only applies if you provide care and then process electronic transactions for insurance payment of that care. There you go. And it doesn't count. Though I said that one time. Well, we do get a credit card uh, for our uh, patient payments. We just don't ever file insurance. That's a tr- electronic transaction. That is not a covered transaction. Covered transactions have to do with claims and and all of these other things. Payment claims, eligibility, referral, prior authorization, claim status, all of those. If you don't do those, deuces. Mm-hmm. I know. That's why, <laughs> that's why HIPAA, the acronym, it stands for Health Insurance Payments Automatically Apply. <laughs> 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 And we're off. Okay, let's get. <laughs> let's move along. So, to, somebody's going to use that uh, somewhere. I swear, David said it. <laughs> yeah, no. And I'm, then we're going to have to deal with that. Was that was him being a goofy fool? <laughs> he was fooling you. He was fooling yep. you. <laughs> However, the next thing. <laughs> That we have is our 405D tip of the week, and I was impressed with what you threw out here for us. Yeah. So you go ahead and share away. Show sure enough. So today's entire right. episode is going to be about connected device security. Are they secure? Well, kind of yeah. the entire episode, but not the, en- the entire rest of the episode until we stop talking about it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it'll get there. Yeah, yeah, there'll be some other things in there for sure. But one of the top five threats in healthcare, and it is also a focus of, guess what? 405D and the hiccup stuff. Mm. Uh, but we do want to remind you that you can go to the 405D website. And what's that URL, Donna? 405D.hhs.gov. Good job. Uh, there are resources there, and they are the four letter F word. Free, <laughs> and you can use those to educate yourself or your team about attacks to connected devices, and then understand how you can implement HICP or Hiccup to help mitigate those risks. And we give you a couple of uh, links to PDFs on the uh, medical device uh, poster that they have there, as 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 well as another little cute little document they have there. And I love using these. Sometimes I'll take little snippets of those posters and use them in presentations and stuff. Yeah, they're great. Yep. So go use them. They're free for free free. <laughs> they're free 99. And- <laughs> <laughs> it's the kind of free stuff that we will not get nailed by the FTC for saying free for free free. <laughs> anyway, that's a great tip for you as we encourage you to worry about Connected devices. But before we get into connected devices, I do want to point out one little thing that's out there that CISA, who we frequently mention, and CISA is involved with developing at this time the (laughs) Circia. Yeah. Circia, Sir, Sir, Sriracha. Sriracha, that that was it. That was I was trying to remember what you came up <laughs> with. Which is a new law, a new part of the Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical Infrastructure Act of 2022. So this you have until November 14th to 
go to the federal e-rulemaking portal to offer information. And the reason I bring this up is it is for critical infrastructure industries. Which, by the way, of the critical infrastructure industries, we have healthcare, public health, emergency services, and information technology industry. Depending on where you fall in there, you could be part of Mm -hmm. this, and you might want to know about this. Because that law, what it's doing is trying to get the information to CISA so that they can take action and start, you know, monitoring these attacks, figuring out where they're coming from. And, and defending the country and our critical infrastructure. And if we don't know what's going on, it's kind of hard to defend against mm-hmm. it, really and truly. You know, it, it goes back to uh, the whole, I can't protect something, I don't know what's happening. And the two things that this act requires is a 24-hour requirement to report any ransomware payments that are made. You need to tell CISA that you've made them. Now, they don't, they don't care any of the details about what you're doing. All they want to know is that you've made them. Now, if you don't make a payment in 72 hours after a covered cyber incident, and that's something to be defined, but if you have a covered cyber incident and you're in the critical infrastructure industries, they want you to, within 72 hours, let them know you had the incident. Okay, that's what it's supposed to do. Now somebody's got to figure out all the rules that apply to that, and that's what this request for is some comments about what are the definitions of a covered entity under this law? What are the definitions of covered incident under this law? What's the scope of it? How do you report it? What kind of policies, procedures, requirements are in place so that you can make these comments up front? and be part of the rulemaking process because uh, this is going to happen. It's a law and it's coming into play and it really is necessary for us to defend ourselves from all of these different attackers. When we look at the different scenarios that we face. Now, that being said, let's now go into uh, our connected devices secure Mm -hmm. Nope. Because it does mention some <laughs> stuff about all those payments being made and those attacks. We can't just say no and end it. <laughs> yeah, we could go with that. Let's see. Well, there's, uh, uh-huh. there's some other information around this that we need to cover. Yeah, there is. A few things. So it's another Poneman Institute report. We like them because of the detail that they include. And this one was done in connection with Scenario. They wanted to get details about connected devices in healthcare. What a great idea. Mm -hmm. Because it's one of our top five threats. Is connected devices not being secure. So we've learned some cool things, haven't we, David? Uh, Cool or concerning? Which one you want to say? Yes. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very concerning from the nerdy standpoint. It's kind of cool to see this kind of detail. But yes, it's very, very concerning uh, information. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so where, where do you think we should start with our concerns? Page seven. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, they do. they do have a really nice executive summary. You could just read that and be done with it because it does give you bullets. But I actually think that it's a little bit more into the details about how they got that executive summary that matters the most. So we've got, you know, the first points, and uh, we'll try not to get too uh, down in a rabbit hole, but let's get it started with the introduction that says, IoT, cybersecurity practices, frequent attacks, and lacking accountability notably impacts patient care. Mm -hmm. I know if Eric hadn't seen this, when he does see it, he's going to like it because he's been trying to get everybody to know that this is about patient care. Yep. And we believe that. We always have. Yep. We've been saying it for years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, 
some reports that Poneman has been involved in in 2021 even revealed that 21% of ransomware attacks are rooted in medical and IoT devices in healthcare. And this was specifically healthcare attacks, ransomware attacks. I did make note of this statement. They made some very, I, I can't say that I have uh, seen uh, a lot of this detail, but they did work on it with scenario. And they, okay, while reading this report, the prevalence of activities and results with the same odds as flipping a coin will become clear. <laughs> that was funny. I know. About half of cyber attacks resulted in adverse imp- impact on patients, and half of those with adverse impacts on patient care report increased mortality rates after a cyber attack. Mm. 24% overall. So half have experienced one or more cyber attacks in the last 24 months, and about half (laughs) report senior management not requiring assurances that IOT and IOMT risk is properly addressed, and almost half (laughs) have experienced at least one ransomware attack in the last 24 months. So I see the theme. Yeah. Everything's flip a coin. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that's that's kind of the the responses that I get when I'm talking to prospects. mm -hmm. You know, you got some people like, well, I don't know, maybe. (laughs) You know, half the time they'll do something, half the time they won't. They'll tell you that you are absolutely qualified. We know you're absolutely qualified. We just don't believe you. Yeah. There you go. Uh, we don't think we think you're wrong. Yeah. We think that you don't understand how different we are from your broad experience. Yeah. Uh, we are we are better than most people out there, so we can't possibly need all that you're talking about. Yeah, because that means they'll look for somebody that's you know that that is that is taking the you got to be faster than the other guy running from the bear a little too far <laughs> yeah it it is an a little well too far. we'll just call it an improper risk management stance there's some assumptions in the plan that i don't think i would use and i encourage you not to that's the way i look at it. anyway the end of this little section is a very telling introductory paragraph here is the end of the introductory session. Patients cannot continue to receive treatment in environments with a quote, heads up, we win, tails, we lose. Heads, we win, tails, we lose. Security mentality at the leadership level. When new technologies and emerging practices are available to reduce risk well below the about half (laughs) Failure rates that are currently experienced. So we can't continue down this path is their point. Mm-hmm. And that they, the teams uh, that are involved in this report, they hope readers find this study informative, beneficial, and ultimately constructive despite the dismal data it presents. Mm. Not good. So we should start with that, David. <laughs> we should start when we have to tell people all the stuff that we have to tell them, you know, where people are going wow, uh, I never laughed so much and and was scared so badly at the same time. <laughs> I'm like, you're welcome. But that that's the same approach that they're taking here is that we know this data after we've reviewed it and we've looked at, you know, 500-something health systems and hospitals, uh, this is what we found, and no, it's not pretty. We're going to just tell you that right up front. Yeah. This is not I'm pretty. Just start telling people your comments to me are dismal. <laughs> yeah, it's dismal, and I it's, it's dismal data. <laughs> All right, I'm feeling dismal today. This that goes with the yep. day. So uh, they get into how did how did the cyber criminals actually disrupt patient care? And uh, I love that uh, uh, HIPAA regulations have led to an environment where data breaches are dis proportionately reported leading to a skewed public perception of the risk healthcare providers face. And I'm like, what? That's when they point out that facilities are confronting attacks that have shifted from bits and bytes to cyber physical threats. Mm. 
when attacks result in adverse patient care, patients face risk. And they point out, you know, a lot of people think about these devices. Okay, so we all hear about the horror story, you know, where they take over their insulin pump and give them too little, too much. Or they attack a, oh, uh, 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 pacemakers and give them stuff that, okay, that's what everybody thinks about. But there's another problem, and that is the impact to services. So, yes, you have the inappropriate therapy or treatment deliveries, maybe due to some of these vulnerabilities. And they say, you know, 26% of that is the impact. But 54, and that to me is, okay, again, you've got a 50-50 chance of we have a major problem and it impacts the care, the ability to deliver care. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's really what it is. It's just the device lets them in. The device may not be the thing that impacts patient care itself. It's the inability to provide patient services. And we've said that over and over. The big problem here is not necessarily that you can restore. It's the amount of time it takes you to recover. Yeah. Well, we often talk about the adverse effects, but I like the way this breaks it down and and gives you a little more detail. Like it says, uh, you know, like you cover the inability to provide patient services, the additional software that has to be installed on the, on the devices, the theft of patient records, the attacker took control of the patient's device. And then Mm -hmm. also you got times where there are inappropriate therapy or treatment that's been delivered to the patient. Those are your adverse effects. That's your impact. There you go. Use that impact. And then, you know, this is this gets back to the dismal data, but the stark difference between healthcare and other entities is in most industries, the true impact of cyber attacks is financial. That's really it. it, it it's a dollar amount. And that's what most people worry about it being just a dollar. Mm-hmm. And in healthcare, it's measured by changes to mortality rates and complications and quality of life. And, it, you know, it, it doesn't really stop at the dollar. Mm-hmm. And so many people see it as the same in, in healthcare as it is in any other industry. It's not. No. And the impacts of, uh, the collateral damage, I love, I'm looking for the Senate. Collateral damage frequently involves increased mortality, more cumbersome procedures, longer stays, and delayed service. Mm. And then the one sentence that I think everybody jumped on with this one because you see a lot of people talk about it. The question is no longer if patients are going to die due to cyber attacks. It's how many already have and when will the industry improve protections to limit it in the future. Yeah. Not eliminate it. <laughs> Just limit it. <laughs> right. And so I think that there's, you know, a pretty big people look at it and they're not thinking about that kind of impact, no matter how many times we hear about the impact of patient care. I don't I it's hard to get people to see it. And uh and then you have everybody talking about uh, what was the headline here? The astonishing breadth of attacks on healthcare. <laughs> ah. The uh, respondents who experienced at least one cyber attack in the last 24 months. So, again, it's half. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's just so constant. I, I'm wondering how much, you know, it's kind of like, well, I've, I've heard that enough. Uh, you know, I've heard it. I've heard it. It's good. We're good. We're done. But let's bring this into our CISA announcement. If you get this report, you know, it is on page 17. Ransomware payments drive a vicious attack cycle. Mm -hmm. So all of these payments that they talk about here, in, that are going on in healthcare, uh, the payments that are being made need to be reported. 
Now, I've seen people floating things out there that we're going to make it illegal to pay ransomware payments. I'm like, you can't, you can't do that. You can't do that. You just, you can't. Uh, you can't make it illegal to recover the data that I desperately need. I, I don't think that will deter people. I think that uh, it, getting them to participate in helping prevent it and, and shutting it down is more effective. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. <laughs> so they do mention uh, scripts. You remember that one? That uh-huh. was the one we did live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when we were reading their their comments when they were down Yep, that episode gets a lot of discussion. They do point that out. It's, you know, strong financial motives, but their point is payment is often the quickest path to recovery, and that's why half of them said they did it, and the amounts tend to be between $250,000 dollars. This is why this business is lucrative. They should go get a real job. <laughs> this is their job, know. you know. This is the job, mm-hmm. and and that's the perfect segue into their next session. When I got a kick out of that, the way they segue that is they're paying two hundred fifty five hundred thousand dollars on top of all the other stuff to get the data back, and so they're like, "Okay, well, how we fix this? <laughs> Financial fines don't provide sufficient motivation." <laughs> Tell me about it. All the people that run around and they say $1.5 million, $1.5 million, that's what we should worry about. I'm like, no, no, because that doesn't, A, motivate people or B, really be, you know, give the problem that we're trying to solve the proper framing. It's kind of like telling me not to speak. (laughs) Well, most people can't wrap their head around large numbers like that. And so they just, eh, whatever. Yeah, it is. What else? We just shut down. <laughs> Mexico. It's not going to happen to me. Going across the border the other way. <laughs> <laughs> the mass exodus of all of us who are going to get uh, fined. But again, the data breaches and all of those things are not the point. You know, when they're paying those things out, just paying out another another financial fine. Uh, they, they'll they just pay it. My insurance will cover it. Or, you know, my lawyers will take care of it. Those kind of approaches, that's not going to solve the problem. And the point here is medical devices do create, and, well, not just medical devices, any connected device creates new challenges that we've never really had to deal with before. I mean, when was the last time you remember in your life, even considering prior to this decade having your refrigerator connected to the internet so that you can look it up from the grocery store. <laughs> I still laugh about that. I know, but it's a thing, yeah. right? You know, it's like it's a thing. I know. I did a I did a uh-huh. um vulnerability scan of my network not long ago and I'm like, why is this stupid vacuum cleaner on the network? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I've got all of my stuff that needs to be all of my different networks on on purpose, you know, so the vacuum cleaner is in its place and the, you know, the, the controls of the lighting and the, all of that stuff you got, you got to secure it. It's great, but you got to secure it. And that's the part everybody's leaving out. Well, the cool thing about it is I just changed my password, my Wi-Fi password for that segment and, and no, no, all the devices stopped connecting. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that is a beaut. It's a good way to stop that. Yeah. yeah, the first time we plugged in and turned on the uh, irrigation system Wi-Fi module, and I put it out there on the, go do some weird stuff and let me monitor what you do, and the very first night it recognized it and said, this is an intrusion, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> now I can go track what you're doing and figure out how to deal with it nicely. But that's not happening with all these medical devices and all these other devices being connected into our networks today. And that's what this whole report is bringing up. And security is the last thing that people think Mm -hmm. about. 
clearly if you're if you're you're getting a, a Roomba on the network or a vacuum on the network rather, uh, ours is named Robbie. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you know, Robbie's stuck. Robbie's on a cliff. No, Robbie's just on a hump. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a concern, and so many of them are like, look, let's just plug this thing in. It works great. Look at all of this cool stuff we can do, and we can help patients. And is anybody saying there's a flip side that won't help patients? Mm-mm. Well, that's what this report is trying to bring to the surface. And uh, they uh, go on to say that, that, you know, there is an awareness, and, and I love this, the... High awareness yet disappointing action section. Nearly every interview or survey involving healthcare professionals refers to cybersecurity being a top priority for their organizations and even references IoT, IOMT devices frequently. This is no different. Seven out of 10 said that this is very high security risk, these devices. And they are very beneficial. So what do they call it? Marvels of modern medicine. Hmm. Yes, it is. <laughs> so it's great. You know about it. But then over half, again, with the half, did not report senior management requiring assurances of properly addressed IoT, IOMT device risk. Most of them. Senior management never ask, should we look at the risk? And two-thirds don't believe their devices are being patched in a timely manner, and we know that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Patching healthcare devices, because think about it. They all talk to different systems, and if I update this thing and now it can't talk to two of the systems I need it to talk to, I'm not able to use it anymore. Or if we update it now, it's not cal- it's not calibrated properly because of this update. Now the numbers that it's giving me on these test results they're not correct, or the monitoring that we're having it do of uh, patient stats not correct anymore. And you know, this is that whole point that um, gets back to the direness. While recognition and discussion of these challenges is a positive leading indicator, the woeful inaction after the words have been spoken is as disappointing as it is discouraging. Ouch. Mm. That, that's, that's just wrong. And so they then start to ask, whose responsibility is it? <laughs> Not mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody's pointing at each other. Uh, and in fact, they even ask, okay, you know, here's the uh, most responsible for this. Is it the healthcare organization, the third party vendor, or the actual manufacturer, or all three? Hmm. Is that a trick question? Yeah, apparently it was. <laughs> According to the answers, it was. <laughs> Who would figure that? Uh, 10% said all three, which is really what it should be. <laughs> Everybody, you know, we're all on the cybersecurity team here. We, if we're not all worried about our part, you know, we, you can't keep the balance. But I love it that the others are like 30% each. So everybody pointed it at the other yeah. person. <laughs> at least a one and a half. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the healthcare organization probably said it was the third party vendor. The third party vendor probably said it was the <laughs> manufacturer of the healthcare organization. That's why those two have a, you know, but for the most part, it gets into, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you go this way, I'll go that way. Uh, we'll, we'll meet somewhere. <laughs> You know, the, the, they point out, I mean, a lot of these devices get old. They're still working. We run into this a ton that you you have to address the fact that these are devices, they've nearly a decade old, and they're still working. And somebody has to be responsible for them, and no one is. And that alone, because, I mean, I love that they, they did ask, who, who's responsible? 
the COO, the CEO, one of those. Nah. Hmm. I think the highest percentage of this was 18% said it's under the CIO, the CTO. But then it's spread out. Is it the CISO or the CTO, the CIO, the operations leadership, network, quality assurance? The actual users of the devices should be responsible. <laughs> Uh, and then I love the 5%, no one is primarily responsible. There's and, your uh, honest people. I don't, <laughs> yeah, well, that or other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what other yeah. would be, but yeah. 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 So other and no one is 8% total. Yep. So it's the same problem is that everybody thinks it's somebody else's problem and it really needs to be a specific assignment that it is someone's concern. Yeah. So I, I personally, you know, we look at it and you've got the health systems and all of that, but you know, we have ASCs, the ambulatory surgical centers that are in tons of groups now that do ortho or ophthalmology or, some of these groups that do things in their office now, you can set that up and they have to have these devices. And my guess is they're even less concerned about the security of it. But uh, they do in the report after going through, we know there are increased attacks on healthcare. We know that they're fueled by inactivity. I love this statement that the, the increased attacks are driven by opportunity. Well, we know that. Mm -hmm. But further fueled by relative inactivity. You know, and media points to the oil pipelines and all of that other stuff. Having more legislation, uh, you know, if you don't put money behind it, it really isn't going to matter. Uh, there's just, there's unintended consequences. <laughs> of what we're already doing. And they end it with saying, our teams hope this report helps inform discussion, impact change, and ultimately protect patients. We fear it may not. Wow. They sound like me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? It's like, well, we hope for the best, <laughs> but we know that it probably ain't going to go far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I honestly, I hate to be the pessimistic person that, I often have to be in this particular role because no matter what we try, we get half the people <laughs> that's not doing what they're supposed to do. It be it becomes yeah. very frustrating, especially when you take mm -hmm. information like this, where you go and you say, Mr. or Miss business owner, practice manager, healthcare, whatever, here's the information, here's the data. People will suffer if you don't take action. And and they just like, well, yeah, but we're doing better than most, so we should be good. <laughs> just, I want to bang my head on a, get to the wall. Yeah, I, I do. <laughs> I do do agree with you on that, and I should leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, let me call 1-800-OCR. <laughs> 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 I know, it's scary, but yeah. Uh, anyway. <laughs> anyway. Uh, that's All it. right, folks, that's our that's show for it. today. Thanks for listening. Remember to follow us and share us out on your favorite social media site if you still have one. Uh, be sure to rate our podcast. Leave us a review. We appreciate that. Help us spread the word. Remember for Donna and myself that HIPAA is not about compliance. We proved it today. It is about patient care. <laughs> You've been listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, hosted by Donna Grendel and David Sims, the show created to help you with HIPAA. For more information or to ask us a question, visit our website at helpmewithhipaa.com. Neither Donna Grendel or David Sims are attorneys, and they do not offer binding legal advice concerning regulatory compliance. The information in this podcast should not be relied upon or construed as legal advice in any way. Consult your attorney for legal advice concerning compliance with HIPAA regulations. <laughs>